hyenas. Who are the hyenas? Dinocrocuta is now known as a true hyena. Who was Dinocrocuta? How and with whom did it live? And what might it have looked like? I speak with fellow paleo artist Dhruv Franklin, and together we reveal the hyenas and Dinocrocuta. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy. It's recording. Awesome. Let's start this. <laughs> Drew. Hey, how are you? I am doing awesome, man. I'm doing awesome. It's good to hear. It's been, it's been exciting. It's been crazy. When did we last talk? We talked about Phyla. Yes, I remember that. That was a while ago. That was a while back. Month back, maybe? Last month, I think. Ooh, a little more, a little bit more. A little more? Yeah, yeah, probably. Summer even. No, it was that was a cool paper, though. Was it, how, That's when it happened. It was the paper king. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then I was like, mm, <laughs> not sure about that. Not sure about, about him being all of that unable. And then, and then I, posted, <laughs> I posted those slightly ungrounded videos about, well, I mean, I got his phone. <laughs> like, man. There's no way that this thing is just not an absolutely deadly creature. <laughs> yeah, sir, got some uh, very powerful weaponry there. Yeah, no, nah, for real. And then, like, I mean, I don't know. Like, I've been doing a lot of investigating with skulls, and I got like a lot of skulls in the background. Yeah, um, I can see. <laughs> I mean, we, we could take a look at that in a second. But uh, like skulls, looking at skulls and the biomechanic of skulls is great, but then like it kind of disregards the whole machine that moves the skull. And then to like, I don't know, I've, I've, I've butchered a few animals in my day and I'm like, okay, so if I'm like there in front of a belly of a thing or in front of legs, what the hell could I do with these canines? It's... Right, yeah, I got you. Wow. So what have you been up to? How you been? I've been good. I've been good. You know, um, just working on commissions here and there, really. How about you? I'm, I'm not working on commissions yet. I definitely got to open that up. I got a few videos coming up about Siberian tiger, Amphi Macairotis. Uh, oh, nice. A really cool one coming up about the comparing the skull of a tiger to a uh, Smilodon. I'm pretty excited. Oh, that's about gonna it. be cool. Oh man, I'm super pumped. I'm super pumped. It's awesome that you have so many skulls to do comparisons with. It's, it's really helpful, I can imagine. Intense. I mean, I'll just let you kind of peek in. We'll only focus, we'll, mm -hmm. generally we'll just kind of focus on the high units, but like, right. I got the serious, like everyone's worried about COVID. I'm not worried about COVID. I'm worried <laughs> serious case of saber tooth. <laughs> right. So I got like Seto Smile is home of theory on Amphi Mechairotis. Megantreon, Smilodon Kretalis, Populator. Um, so it's, it's, it's gonna be, it's like a work in progress. And I'm kicking myself. I'm like, man, I got all this stuff that I could do, but it's like, it's all good. I'm doing it. <laughs> um, so you've been working on commissions. I saw some of, mm -hmm. you got like some hyena material that I saw, was that for commissions? Mm, oh, I think I know what you're talking about. Like the the yeah, actually that that's not for commissions, but I'm working on um a little series comparing three hyenas, uh, spotted brown and um stripe, their skull and their like skull morphology, just doing like some sketches of those, trying to understand their anatomy. I suppose sort of similar to what you're doing as well. Although I don't have um specimens to compare with in front of me. It's but cool. yeah, it's very it's very rewarding. Just you know, you know, focusing on a specific group of animals for a long time you really begin to understand their biomechanics and stuff yeah yeah i uh just right actually before our talk i um i mean you know it's a real honor to have access to the museum and i went to the museum of natural history and i was like hey can i have take a look at some hyena material and i got to look at uh at a striped hyena skeleton and just lay oh, nice out. And just kind of like see, okay, like skull, yes, but then like really solid neck, and then like the longer, sure. 
for sure. The longer thoracic spine and like a dinky little back and then like pelvis, although the pelvis was right. Big. Um, yeah, no, I really like those, the, the, the renderings that you did. They were really kind of convincing and they showed, you know, like that's that what that's the stripe, that's the brown. There's really quite a st striking difference between the- Thank you. Glad it came off that way. Sweet, man. Do you have any commissions that, I'm, I've not seen any of your commission work. Do you have one that's- Oh, like yes, mostly under wraps at the moment, but I, I, could, I could definitely uh, show you some off camera, I guess. <laughs> yeah, off camera, off camera. Is there, yeah, yeah, top um, secret stuff. Is there, oh, so top secret, you can't talk about it. No, no, not really. I'm just joking around. Ah, okay. Do you have one that's like, that you're particularly excited about? Um, there's, again, I can't really, yeah, yeah, I'd say there is. Um, again, I can't really um, talk specifics, but a lot, mostly, mostly Pleistocene stuff, to be honest. Pleistocene. Pleistocene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's potent, dude. Really potent. Oh, that's amazing. I, I, I mean, it's such a nice time period to work on because we just have such a, a vast wealth of knowledge of like information and you know it's just it's the closest we'll get to reconstructing a prehistoric environment you know yeah so it's it's really helpful to you know work on that that time and, period and it's so relatable too it's like i mean dinosaurs nowadays they're like i mean i don't know i find it a little hard i mean i love dinosaurs but my love is definitely shifted towards the pleistocene and the mammal stuff for sure and sure. it, you know, it lends the modern people really lend themselves to illustrate that world. And um, it really lends to bridging the gap where you kind of show something that's similar than that, that similar to what it is today, but then that contrasts that, that also create a contrast and then creates a focus on right. today. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's really cool. cool. It's really cool. Um, have you been looking at some of the David Attenborough BBC productions on Netflix? Oh, I haven't checked out the new one. I've heard it's good though. Have you checked it out? Yeah, the, what is it? Life on Our Planet by David Attenborough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I mean, the one. not so much, it's not quite like Our Planet or like Night on Earth. Right, right. It's, it's much more like David Attenborough really laying down the sauce and like he kind of goes in and like he presents what his life was like and then he kind of presents this like, I mean, he shows the pattern of like carbon mat, carbon particles per, per million and then like population rises. And then he predicts the stuff and you're like, man, that voice talking about the extinction of tigers, the extinction of all megafauna, I, I was shedding tears and I was really sort of distraught about that. But then he shows like, you know, like, oh, like the Holland and like all the future of farming, solar, regeneration of forests. And I'm like, fucking yeah, dude, bam, <laughs> fucking cities. Yeah, yeah. I'll definitely have to take a look at that then. I was watching the other day, A Kingdom of the White Wolf. Have you seen that? Yeah, by PBS. That one's so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really gives you like a, it's so cool. It's about the wolves on Ellesmere Island, right? And so it really gives you such a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, he's a great wildlife photographer. Ridiculous. I mean, the drone footage and then like the, um, I don't know, it, it really makes them personable and that the fact that, cubs are super vulnerable and you have to get them out of the den and on their feet and traveling it's this come on this it's out there but we need to bring them here and there's these young people youngsters that you know are right right and, ah, it's there's weird. definitely like a sense of family in that documentary it was almost sort of like dynasties but for arctic wolves yeah you know what yeah, i mean that's what yeah, yeah. like I, it's it's so incredible to see how those documentaries are like getting traction and uh, mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're, they're infinitely compelling regardless, but the fact that they're, uh, they're getting and that we're becoming aware is, is so cool. And then we have this technology to, to really see these animals on the land and then zoom in, zoom in, zoom out. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, the future of docu well up documentaries is a, uh looking bright hopefully you know with all this new technology like um night on earth i think that's what it's called right wow that was cool that was cool as well when like the elephant just like they zoom out on the borneo elephant with like the huge long tail and you're like dude that's a plant <laughs> a freaking plant with all the plant veins and everything and then like ocelot hunting the freaking bird oh it was crazy damn absolutely nuts and then and then again you're looking at that and you're like well it's it's cool, but 
but then it's kind of like highlighted tidbits. And like, I wonder, I think the Smithsonian has got a lot more money paid to those, to those people in those landscapes to get a lot of like the really juicy stuff, like the hunts right. and whatever. So yeah. stuff that like some private networks that we're not even getting to see yet. <laughs> True. Which is really cool. Do you follow Kevin Richardson? I th- think so. Um, maybe. Line, I'm sure if you showed me the line, their stuff, I would be like, yo, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't follow them. I, yeah, I've seen their stuff here. That, I, should, I should follow them more regularly, though. They're re- great. His have a really cool interaction with So intimate. It's amazing. Like, recently, he had, yeah. he had a couple ones where he went in with his Black Leopards, and generally, I'm like, I'm telling everyone, I'm like, I love big cats. Leopards are like, you keep them at an arm's length, and that's it. But there, he was just like so intimate with these animals. He knew them so well. He's like, this guy, he'll come in, he'll come out. I'll leave him alone. This girl, she's really cute. She's really sweet. I'll come follow her, this and that. Here's some catnip. They like the drugs, this and that. And it's really cool. <laughs> and this hyena material is also really cool because you just get to be really intimate with I mean, you get to be intimate with him in the, in in participating right. in the footage. So, so yeah, man, it's like it it really kind of brings out this new vibration, this new way of thinking and interacting with hyenas, which is, you know, really great in context of the Lion King, you know, mainstream view of them. Right. Yeah. That's for sure. Should we take a look at some hyenas? Let's do it then. Yeah. All right, I'll bring them up. All right, so we got little tiny little artwolf. <laughs> Protellies. Protellies. I think this is a female, so she's like not even that big for an artwolf. Stripes. Yeah. Oh, nice, nice. The brown. Oh, you have all, do you have all four? Oh, wow. That's awesome. All, dude. <laughs> nice, nice. Mm-hmm. Impressive. Um, oh, wow. So, I mean, you're familiar with all, with all, with all these species. I've, um, have you, have you ever encountered hyenas? Like in a zoo or like in a, in a place? Is, yeah, yeah. I've seen spotted hyenas in, the, in a zoo, but honestly, I haven't seen, I don't think I've seen either brown or striped or even aardwolves um, elsewhere though. I've never seen an art wolf. I've, I mean, I've been to Africa. I've been, I've seen, I've not seen hyenas in the wild. No, I have. I've seen them in the Kruger. I've seen a few cubs on the side of the road. I was saying, nice. That's cool. That's cool. I've been to the Kruger. I, I don't think I saw any, uh, I don't think I saw any hyenas though. I was much younger though. So you've been to Africa? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. When I was like six, you know, five or six though. Yeah. So I don't remember too much, but I definitely want to go back at some point. Was it a very powerful experience? Mm, for sure. I, I, getting to actually see, like, even at, like, a young age, it made, like, a huge impression on me. Yeah, I feel that. I was there when I was nine. I was in Tanzania. I don't remember much, but I remember seeing elephants, like, right close to the car, and I'm like, there's this fucking monster. Like, it's just here. Like, oh my God. Um, I remember seeing lions. But then I went to South Africa, and I volunteered at a wildlife place. And there we got to, I mean, there, like, I get, I get there and there's a cheetah enclosure and I'm like, there's a cheetah. And then there's a hyena, a spotted hyena. And it's just got its neck up against the thing. And I'm like, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, oh, it's just loving the scratches on the neck. <laughs> and I'm like, there it is. And I got to touch it. And I'm like, like, I got to see it eat a piece of elephant skin. And I was just chomping oh, wow. in the mouth. Um, and then I got to like, we were at, um, cleaning feeding cages of the, of the cheetahs and they had had a warthog and I they had a warthog skull like a, just a head and I brought it oh in the cage itself in the cage in the, in the feeding cage. oh wow right right that's cheetah. cool and I brought it to the hyena enclosure and I'm, I'm gonna just toss it over there and I'm standing there and I'm like standing there probably about like seven meters away from 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 Krokuta Krokuta and it's <laughs> I'm feel I feel the popping and crunching of the bones through the ground through my feet as this thing is wow. just ripping apart this warthog skull and then there's just nothing left within a few minutes. <laughs> Insane. Insane. Wow. That's crazy to be able to see that. Yeah. Wow. Brown. I've 
I was at the same place. There was a brown hyena that was quarantined, but we never got to see it because it was super stressy. Because uh, it was a right. Hyena. And then the spotted hyena, which is, I mean, you know, you. Yeah, I'll just come in close. <laughs> impressive yeah the dentition's crazy it's it's nuts it's really quite like unlike anything else i mean like the carnassials like i like to compare like when i talk about homotheres for example or saber-toothed cats i like to talk about like okay compared to hyenas but those blades are super large and really well developed and then this like this complex the one right three where like that is just chomp, chomp, bone crushing, and very wide. Mm -hmm, yeah, it's interesting that the uh, the step hyenas of Europe had even wider skulls. It seems. I wonder what was going on there. The um, crocuda, crocuda spilia. Spilia, yeah. Although I think I might be wrong, but I think they actually got designated to a species level. But I might be wrong on that. I wouldn't be surprised. I've uh, at yeah, the Natural yeah. History Museum. I got to see like a replica of it, and it, it, it was very crocuta crocuta like. But just like, I mean, if this is sort of almond shape, like their their skull is more just bulky and round. Um, right, right. And they probably were subject to like uh, like I mean they had winters, and so they were subject to a lot more pressure, um, like reproductively, I suppose, because like there's only one yeah for sure. Use. So it was probably yeah. like focused on like one or two children and really trying to like dissuade everybody else from eating and trying to get those kids to eat while mm -hmm. they're Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was something that was in the Kingdom of the White Wolf Doc, I think. Right. There was just like it's like Where they made sure the, the pups ate first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That the kids eat. Uh, there's another documentary about white wolves by PBS where there was um there was dominant female and then another related female that was nursing the pups. And it got to the point where that side female didn't eat and then starved to death. Like literally really? yeah, did not try to, was not like trying to get at the food and was just like, I, and then eventually she just starved to death. It was, and then to see that wow. was dramatic. Um, striped and then brown from the people that I've, talked to at the that center they said that like hyena spotted hyenas when you give them bones they'll chew on them but when you when you got brown hyenas they leave nothing behind and well wow. that might be because they're like i mean like a lot less social and i think the sociality of it that's all social behavior like a longer 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 blade versus the brown hyena which was a much smaller car right i see that you know and like i don't know i think this is a wild i mean i don't know i suppose that like i'll just assume that these are wild wild caught but mm -hmm. there's a lot more wear on those teeth than in the than you think those top. ones yeah. right because brown the browns are a lot more they're solitary they don't yeah i think they're more solitary than they're definitely more solitary than krakuta but i do think that sometimes they do form small groups of like three or four occasionally like a mother and her young yeah stay together for a little while but certainly not to the extent of krakuta yeah no. for sure. i think there's there, there's a documentary about them on maybe on youtube um where the, there's a guy that he follows them on in botswana and then he talks about how they're, they're not overtly social, but there's like, the, the, again, the den is really the, 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 um, the linking point for a clan, which is loosely associated, but a lot more reliant right. on a sort of solitary mode of, of, of foraging. Yeah. And they're kind of, they're confined to Southern, Southern Eastern Africa. And they're very, they're, I mean, they, they kill. Yeah, it's very interesting how small their range is. Like I, I, I was looking, apparently, I mean, at, at one point, some people had identi like identified a brown hyena skull from, I think the interglacial somewhere in Europe, but apparently that was just a misidentification. And it seems their whole like range is confined to Southern Africa. Unless I'm, I might be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure that it's been there since like, they've been there 
since the Pleistocene, and basically that's just, true. Just that's true. There. And how they've evolved, they they've pretty much segregated themselves the southern eastern Africa, well southern Africa, yeah, southern Africa, and um, but they have a very diverse range of of feeding modalities, and they are certainly capable of. I suppose expanding the range. I mean, they go from anything from eating cattle to cracking open just hard foods and hard bones, and um, and eating sea lions and living in, mm -hmm. in the desert. I guess maybe right. there's there's they're suppressed by the spotted hyena, which are social, and there's competition between those two species. Yeah, I wonder what factors are going on there. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's definitely possible. Because hy I mean, hyenas, I was just watching a video about hyenas going to war with each other and how they just maim and dismantle and break the paws and mangle the face of conspecifics that they're at war with. And it's just brutal. I mean, I can watch, I can, I can be fine eating and like watching a hyena destroy an Impala, which is just, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I mean, it's almost artful but it's quite gruesome but then to watch another hyena do it to another hyena is like a different it feels personal it's negative it's very antagonistic um mm -hmm. yeah hyenas are very brutal when they want to be for sure stripes i mean that's the that's an indian hyena these guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, although they're, I mean, I think their range is like much further, but yeah, I think the only Indian hyena there is. The only non African hyena there is. They, um, they, yeah, you're right, you're right. They, they, I think they live in the Horn of Africa, then in, I think there's two pop, no, there's, there's, they're east, eastern, eastern Africa, maybe northern Africa, and then the Arab Peninsula. They sometimes are even found in Turkey, Armenia, uh, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. yeah. Pakistan, India. And you know, there's like, that's the hyena that lives around tigers. And it's, it's small. It's like quite a lot smaller than say like a spot. And this is a big individual, um, big individual spot, a striped hyena. And they have, what's interesting, they have this tiny diminutive little carnassial with, oh, wow with quite a lot more cusps. Like there's this, right. cusp, there's the blade obviously, but then, you know, it's a lot less derived. There's still that very kind of characteristic hyena jaw and they're, sure. they're, they're the smallest of the bone crushes. For sure. And um, I mean, they're quite beautiful actually. I think they're really good looking. Uh, they're very striking. Um, in, like in life, you mean? Yeah, in life, in life, they're very, yeah. they have that huge crest mane. Mm -hmm. um, and they're extremely rangy. They, they're never, they're never abundant. But they have these like loose, like long, flowy, long legs. And they just yeah. go, and go and they go on these lat, these vast, long forays um, to get, I mean, I don't think they're much of a hunter. They may be pursuit carnivores, mm -hmm. but yeah not particularly like they're not they're not in the same league of hunting as say like a striped a spotted hyena no certainly not i've even heard about like their because wolves were played a big part in the canids played a big part in the extinction of a lot of hyenids across the world but i've heard reports where striped hyenas will even sometimes associate with wolf packs and be tolerated and mm. travel together. Is that oh, something? they'll be tolerated? Interesting. Yeah. I did not know that. I was aware that they would sometimes follow wolf packs to try and get like the leftovers, but I didn't realize they were also tolerated. That's very interesting. I don't know if it's ever been documented or if it's just anecdotal evidence by pastoralists who see them associated with wolves, but I mean, it would be, it'd be, right. it'd be a pretty cool step for them to adapt to that and be like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna tone down the aggression. We're gonna try to survive here with these dogs and then make our best out of this situation. Ooh, they also have yeah, oh man. So they also have molars. This little vestigial thing. Oh wow. Could you zoom in on that? Yeah, we're gonna see here. Molar. Uh 
And that's not present on the other species, huh? The brown, the brown has it. It's what, like- Oh, oh, he does. Water. Right, right, right. But the spotted, they don't have it. I think they sacrificed that. Interesting, interesting. To be- That's cool, it's very cool. Just looking at skulls, like for example, bears, I see like, for example, the cave mm -hmm. bear. Cave bears missing some of the peg-like premolars bringing a lot more strength to the back of the skull and the chewing mechanism. But then the presence of those premolars, I don't know if that, like in my theory, in my, I don't know, the edges of my thinking go where the presence of teeth that may be reduced and useless at the end might be able, might be a place where gum can actually contract around and then might be able to strengthen the overall structure to some extent. I don't know. Interesting. I mean, I think it's interesting. I think it possibly that opening of the diastema might have to do with the more herbivorous diet of the cave bear, possibly, because mm -hmm. I think in a lot of herbivores, you also see that there's like, I mean, comparing herbivores to carnivores, carnivores usually don't have that much of like a, a gap between, you know, the front teeth and the back teeth, that diastema, whereas herbivores do. And I think the, the purpose of that is to be able to manipulate like plant matter, you know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. So it might, it might possibly have to do with that as well. That is true. Like a lot of things, I mean, they lose their incisors, herbivores, for example, and then it's just this chisel thing. And then this large area with no teeth. That is true. And that's also present in, yeah, that's definitely present in. Teeth. Right. Mm -hmm. It's also present in the saber too. So <laughs> for different reasons, I suppose, for like the jaw. <laughs> whatever. Right. And then we finish up with like, but I mean, Ardwolf is completely different from everything else. I mean, it still has this hyenid uh, nasal pinching. And I think they could like deliver quite a powerful bite if they really wanted to, because they have these canines that kind of slide up against themselves, like slides. Yeah, slide. yeah, they're interesting like that. But pegs, like useless pegs. Yeah, it's nothing there almost. Nothing, it's just a big wow. tongue, tongue pressure. Uh, that would maintain, uh, I guess, jaw strength. But they can roar. They can like do a really aggressive sound. They can raise their hackles. Really? And be very, very intimidating. Yeah, I did not know that. Big old auditory bull up. Oh, wow, yeah. Have you done much like investigation yeah. into like auditory bulla anatomy? Uh, not, not much, although I did read that there was a paper um, on Dino Krakuta's auditory. You've seen that paper, right? Right, describing all that in that area generally. But I haven't done much like general research into the auditory bulla. How much of that paper did you read? I think I read like more than half of it. But then I just was like, it was like the vast majority was like auditory bulla stuff, and I was like, I was trying to find more stuff relating to like the external appearance. Um, so I sort of skimmed after like the half of that, but yeah, it was still cool. It was still very cool. I read the intro and then I looked at the picture and I'm like, man, there's like the skull, which is its own amazing universe. And then there's this, which is like, it's yeah, it so well preserved. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, ah, I'm like, I get it. It's like 37 I'm, pages just on that little back part. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, it's like a thing where you're like, that is so much value, but like, I mm, no. <laughs> I like I just got like, yeah, yeah. the point in the discussion and I'm like, okay, I get it. So pretty much it's not not a hyena and definitely is definitely is a hyena. And uh yeah, I get mm. then I read I read also there's um I think by uh, Jack Tseng, he had a jaw jaw um finite element crash test. Mm -hmm. And then a skull crash test where he compares it. Yes, yes. He did one paper on the mandible and then one on the cranium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That was cool. And then I think the one thing I noticed from that other paper about the go ahead. You no, know, you go. Oh, okay. I think the one thing that I noted in the other paper describing like the basic cranial anatomy was that they, th they said there was a larger area of attachment for the sternomastoid muscle than typical hyenas, which was interesting. So like like, which is like like part of the neck muscle complex this yeah thing. this one right here i think yeah yeah Comes down to the chest yeah hyenas mm -hmm. hyenas i mean hyenas necks hyenas like the entire like this sort of energy circle like from from 
they don't have thumbs. Hyenas don't have thumbs, so they're here. Like everything from like arm to the inside to the mouth, ugh, like pulled back, super Yeah. Powerful. I mean, the, like there, right here, like all of that, that is just very, very strong. I mean, you see them rip, rip, mm-hmm. twist and rip is, is an, twist, rip, and then hold, carry. Because hyenas, they carry things very well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's so many pictures of them like running around with like limbs and like heads in their mouths. You there's, know? there's a great. Have you seen the one where like it's like a, a like a lion's head neck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen that. Ad- that caused quite a, that caused quite the stir on the internet. Oh, it's pretty great. I really like that picture, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, let me do that with Amphimachirotus and Dino Krakuta Gigantia. That would be, you know, defeats the saber tooth. That would be very cool. That's definitely a huge list of things that I want to draw. Um, but recently, what do you draw on? Um, I have a small sketchbook that I usually uh, draw my sketches on, but if not, I'm, I'm usually digital, I suppose. Okay. What do you What do you use? For digital? Uh, just, just normal pencils, you know. Just, oh, for digital, I have like a little, I have like an Intuos tablet and a stylus. Okay. I just recently went. What about you? I recently went digital. I went digital in July. I started to use just like a, like, it's not an iPad Pro. Oh, nice. it's, it's just a regular iPad. And it's just right. revolutionized everything. Like currently, like, I mean, I'm working with <laughs> just cat skeletons um big cat skeletons mm-hmm. and I've, I've finished them and i'm like uh, what well what, what now but now i can really interact with the, the with the the structure in a revolutionary way and like a really mm-hmm. new i know i know yeah the I, layers are like so helpful to be able to like just you know pull back everything and oh, it's great yeah it just like it's a con- the flow continues you know, with a sketch, you kind of get to a point where you're like, ah, it's, it's a mess. It's a mess. The pause, the pause and the different things and the, like the layers there, you just new layer, new layered. Ah, it's amazing. I really love it. <laughs> I really love it. And like, that's allowed me to like, I mean, I was like, oh, I'm going to talk about Dino Kakuta. Let me do some sketches. Let me do some things. And right. have, have you seen any of the skeletons of Dino Kakuta? No, I haven't seen much of the postcranial remains. I think there was one paper I saw, but the abstract only said like uh, proportionally, it's roughly similar to that of um, spotted hyenas. I think I have a. I'll send you. I'll send you a good skeleton. Um, oh, okay. There is one out there, and that's the one I've been. Really? Using. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 pretty damn good. Um, oh wow! You can get the vertebrae count, and you can like really figure it out, and it's. Like dino- really, we'll get to dino- Kakuda. It's wow. a tank. It's just nuts. But just to wrap up with modern hyenas, sinuses. Mm-hmm. Huge, huge perforations of like, like, pe- like. I mean, everybody. You have. Uh, we have sinuses like right here. But then in them, right. they, they're all the way across the skull. Right back. Mm-hmm. to help that smooth distribution of stress and stuff. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And you can, and then like the striped, theirs are a lot less developed. And I mean, just size-wise, they're not quite there yet. And as you mm-hmm. progress, there is increase in, in width of the frontals and increase in the volume of those sinus cavities. And what's actually interesting is I did, a, this was back in uh, a few years ago, I did a project in, in college where I was like, where they were like, okay, you guys can do a project about an animal. And I'm like, the immediate thought for me was like, why do hyena females have such huge dicks? And the reason, right. is, the boiling down of it is, it takes a lot of time to build a hyena child because a hyena child yeah. needs a long time to build a skull. And then because mm-hmm. it takes such a long time to build a skull and hyenas are so efficient, the social aspect of, of spotted hyenas made it such that only the biggest, baddest, nastiest females could 
clear the space so that the babies could get to their food. And that had an effect on um, hormone levels where the fetuses became more exposed to masculine androgens in utero, creating this more aggressive, aggro, ferocious female, wherein, you know, when they're born, hyena kids, if it's a brother and a brother, they usually figure it out and it's kind of peaceable. If it's a female and a male, the male will always submit to the female. And if it's two females, one will kill the other. And that's just how that kind of competition happens. And it's because yeah. of this pressure of building a really robust skull in a competitive feeding environment. And the, you know, I mean, the skull of a hyena, I mean, we've, I, I've, you, you've seen the videos of them ripping the things apart and that like the wildebeest is there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Insane. Absolutely insane. It's crazy, yeah. But hyenas are not the top predator in, the, I mean, they're, they're dominant, absolutely, but they're always ruled over by cats. You know, whether they are, mm. you know, if there are yeah, lions, yeah. lions will go and lord over the hyenas, brown or striped, brown or um, brown or spotted. And then wherever there are, you know, leopards around striped hyenas, leopards dominate, tigers dominate. I'm not even going to mention the Ardwolf because he's not even in that league. So what about Dino Crocuda? Yeah, I think we you know, definitely got an interesting situation going on there in terms of its ecology and role in the Predator Guild. We bring him in? Yeah, let's do it. Oh my gosh. Wow, it really just dwarfs all the others in comparison. This is the queen. She is huge. She is killing it. She is big mama matriarch hyena. And this is, this, I mean, this is not even, this, this just dwarfs it everything. And this skull, this was made by Gaston Design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Online. The bone clone skull is 10 centimeters bigger. Really? Yeah. Are they from the same specimen? Uh, or they're not from the same specimen. They're from they're they're two different specimens. I don't know. Well, this one came from Guangzhou, China. That's the that's the only information available about this locality. Um, the one from bone clones, I'm not I haven't really read anything much about it, but this I think the teeth are about the same size, but it might be this specimen. It might be a male specimen. This might be a female specimen. I can't really speak to the to the sexual dimorphism between them. But that this is not even as big as they got. That's crazy to think about. It's insane. It's just nuts. And I think in uh, in uh, in the auditory region. Oh, have you read the one where it talks about the um, rhino that was attacked? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, the Chalotherium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it talks I have about read that. different species of um, uh, the, the species that it, that it lived with. And it talked about um, Machairotus planetary, which was, it was, it was not, it was, it was smaller than this. Mm -hmm, for sure. It was smaller. I'll bring in Amphi Machairotus in a bit. But that was the one time, if not, well, one of the times where a hyenid was just not just like by a small margin, but like a large margin, top killer beast in its environment. Wow. It's a crazy skull. The contour of it is just so extreme. You know, that vaulting and like the short snout. And the, you know, the widened nasal bones, the fusion, mm. the, like this volume here, um, this sort of step here like that. Um, they, they were talking about how it's almost like a borophagine, like a boro, borophagus um, in its profile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. yeah, they have a similar skull contour. Right, yeah. and then, I mean... 
they have, I mean, like, that's a brown hyena, and then that's, like, a dino. It's just nuts. Um, it's crazy. The size of those carnivores. And, like, every, I have Panthera Atrox. I have uh, Polar Bear. Uh, I have Liger. But this thing, it just, it just isn't, it just surpasses them all. It's just a different kind of wow. bug. Um, although, the, although I have Agriotherium, and I don't know much about Agriotherium, and I think they live together, and that might be approaching, oh. but n- nothing, like, nothing is Carnassials this size. I mean, right. Spotted Hyena, I mean, like, yeah, it's a similar size blade, but, like, the bone crushing capabilities of that thing is on a different scale. Um, the thickness of the chin. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's something I also noticed, especially like that uh, anterior end there is just like so, well, it's so, just goes down so much quicker, it seems like. Yeah. I mean, this thing, like, for that, that I think, like, that Chilotherium probably was, he would probably, like, it was, it would just like a bear trap, just get on that skull, and then it's like, yeah, go ahead, run, I'll hold on. I'll like, just, I'll hold on, and then you can try to pry yourself free. You'll, you know, the thick, round canines and then a really long, thin um, coronoid process. And just this whole area is very thick, very wide. And I think um, there's, of course, like finite element allows us to find out how resistant to bending a skull might be, but it doesn't really, go into like the character and the nature of the biting. And I think a skull with a long coronoid process would be a lot more, well, first of all, it'd be a lot more able to go for a long continuous crushing moment, but also it would be able to have a lot of muscle fibers that would be able to go in again and again and again and fire continuously to hold on to to create continuous pressure. Um, that would be necessary for deliberate action on bone to then let it to to then get to a point where it pops and yields to uh, Mm -hmm. to the dino cocuta the carnassial is i mean the typical feliform shape but it also has that uh, conid which is present in well to a small degree in in the uh right in the brown i think i can see that yeah yeah here and then it's there it's like there yeah 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 yeah. i get the focal present in the spotted hyena which is i I guess it's not as derived i mean cats have it ontogenet ontogen in their childhood they have this present this cone present which you know it's it's oh it's just the v-shape but no it's it's definitely a molariform molar tooth that has become seriously derived um, it just, like, I mean, and then this is, I mean, this is a cast, a skull, an actual skull would probably have a significant weight. Um, mm-hmm. It'd be a very heavy piece of bone, piece of equipment. Um, what is really quite incredible is, I don't know how to show you this, but this, first of all, it's really thick. But then there's also a very deep pocket here. It's, it's very it's like a very powerful area. Right. Yeah, yeah, I see that. We have attached to. And then this carnassial is, is just very They're huge. Vaulted, nice round palette. And then of course. Yeah, very wide, very wide skull. Wide back, mastoid processes. And then the big long auditory meat ma- uh, auditory canal, where mm-hmm. it was probably adapted to bolster strength from like I mean a lot of pressure from over this side, while it was killed. right. And
glad these things are not around. Yeah, it would have been interesting to see like how they would have, you know, done in the Holocene. I don't know. I mean, it's just so large. It would be kind of, you know, it would just be, I, I can't even like begin to think about like that animal. Like, it's hard to even just imagine it existing, you know, when it was around, let alone the Holocene. I mean, looking at it like right next to you, imagining what it would, just how much bigger it would be with soft tissue on it as well. Like, yeah, it would. I mean, it would yeah. probably stand, stand here. Like it would feel. Yeah, it would just, yeah. It would feel a person around like it ain't nothing. What happened to that person? You, you, nothing. No, no evidence. Nothing. Nothing else. Just gone. Just vanished. I mean, it, it was. It lived in. A, I mean, the environments that it lived in were probably very rich. I mean, giraffids, civithere, mm -hmm. rhinos, gomphotheres. It was a very expensive machine. Yeah, for sure. Would have been, have to, would have had to take in a lot of calories, you can imagine, to develop all that, all that, you know. All that thickness. <laughs> It's interesting um, that in the basic cranial, not the basic cranial description, the other two, the uh, finite analyses papers, they mentioned that I think the development period was like a, the, the weaning process would have been, or the weaning time was extended in Dinocracuta because the subadult of the Dinocracuta seemed, I think they said, was it? like basically the same as subadult Krakuta, but almost less so developed. And so they, they, they hypothesized, I think, that it would have taken longer for Dana Krakuta to reach like that sort of level of robustness if I was, if I read correctly on that. I read that too. And I was it, wondering what kind of ecological impact that would have had. Yeah, it was, it was very vulnerable um, for a much longer time. It just had to develop, um, for a longer time to become competitive and become able um, mm -hmm. and to grow into this machinery fully. Um, yeah. And, uh, that was a massive vulnerability. Um, and if the things were subject to change, that would be, I mean, you know, like things, when things work, they go supersized. That's been, a, that's a pattern seen in dinosaurs and throughout um, a lot of evolutionary periods, and then carnivores, and then as soon as something changes, then it's the mega beasts that become uh, compromised because they don't have access to such a rich resource. Um, so yeah, I would imagine them to be a very, like three, four years of dependence. On mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of investment in that that one individual or so you know yeah i don't think i can imagine mortality could have been high yeah i think yeah i don't think they did maximum two three kids would be pushing it one kid mm -hmm. would be like the norm so yeah they, they they reproduced slowly in the occupied land sort of continuously and it was like they had long tenure over areas and they probably relied upon um, individuals really having, you know, discernible boundaries and they relied upon stability on the land, uh, stable ecosystems with a lot of, I mean, a lot of civetheres, a lot of giraffids, a lot of bone. That's it. I can't really, I, I can't really speak to what their social lives must have, must have been. I don't think they were very social. I think they were probably lone guns, like lone, they operated probably alone. I don't think they bandied, definitely not like hyenas today. And I think they were probably even more like bound to their landscape, bound to their territory and aggressively defending their patch from any other um, 
individuals that are not of reproductive value. Agree. I could I could see though, I could see maybe they're like yearlings and then their cubs maybe sticking together. You know, that would be an interesting. That could be an interesting thing. Oh, so that they could be like wolves, like wolves see. helping helping Wait. each other out with uh, with raising of cubs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Children might be staying with mom and then helping raise the next generation. Potentially, potentially. Right. Yeah. That's really, I see, I guess the, the, the largest social grouping I could see because even with such a, a rich uh, environment to live in, being so large, I doubt they could support very large group sizes anyway. You know, the, cal the, the calorie intake versus outtake is just not worth it. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I doubt like, oh man, I, um, I think they must have had, they probably communicated with each other long distance though. They probably had a, like a, like a, like a mm. call. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was in bed today. Yeah. I was waking up today. Like a wolf call, but like a hyena call. Like a hyena, yeah. Like something, like, like I would imagine it being something long, like, like a couple of calls, like a one, I was, I was in bed this morning. And I, someone was trying to start up a car, and it was just like I'll just imitate it. Like a... It was like something like that. Yeah, like, yeah, I know. Oh, it, it, like something long, terrible, and sinister, like loud and echoing. Uh, yeah. Oh, like like something like 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 night is falling, and all of a sudden this note just breaks. Almost like a siren. Yeah, yeah, like a one time, like, yeah, oh my God. Um, <laughs> it must have been a horrifying cry for like anybody would be like, oh no, he's gonna deploy, deploy the monster beast. Ah. It's truly a terrifying thing. But also, like, I, I, was, I was, this was, I was looking at stuff about cougar research and they were talking about how predators in general are, yeah, they're this terrible force that does a lot of killing, but ultimately it's a, on the, on the scale of the landscape, it's a very giving force. It's a force that provides a lot of um, nutrition to the ground and then further spreads that, those nutrients via the, um, the tools on the landscape that spread out that meat in you know through their gut and feces so yeah so you know as much of a as terrible as a factor this thing was it must have been a very good regulatory force for populations of rhinos civetheres elephants and then to redistribute that resource across the landscape um to other smaller hyenids to um, emerge mm. from other smaller species, and um, then to also break apart the, the you know the tough bone and fiber that um, that these that the herbivores were made of. Yeah. So like, and then this would go this uh, this statement will go out to dino cocoons specifically, but also all the carnivora as a a very potent ecological um, redistributor and regulator of these plant carnivores, of plant hunters that would otherwise overrun and tax um, a system. Yeah, they're necessity. They're yeah. absolutely, ne yeah, they're an absolute necessity. And then there's also, I think that in, uh, in, in um, this was done in wolf research, there's the fear factor the factor of like, okay, this valley is occupied by a predator. Therefore, this keeps, you know, all the um, hoot things moving. It keeps them, it keeps them- On the move. On the move. It keeps yeah. them stagnating, which is important, which creates a rich and diverse, which creates little pockets of vacant territory that can become diverse and dense and be inhabited by you know, more diverse and specific kind of people. But yeah, I, I, I totally got your point about, it's not simply like a matter of redistributing the nutrients, it's also creating that actual sense of fear and urgency in these herbivores to keep them 
like you said, not from stagnating and over grazing or over browsing a certain area, but keeping them on a move and, you know, you redistribute them, redistributing them, them and their ecological presence through the landscape. I agree. And that's why carnivores are just, I mean, they're useful. They are very useful tools on the land that are far better at doing what they're supposed to do and to make the land nutritious and abundant in a natural way than this, you know, artificial way that we've, that we like to think that we're doing a good job at, say, guys with, you know, on a tree stand, standing there and like creating, uh, creating, creating vacancies in sort of these, in, in, the, in the prey populations. I'm not saying hunting is a negative force, but it's, it can be complemented by a much better and natural force, which is the carnivora, the carnivora factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they've been evolving for millions and millions of years to do that sort of specific task. So obviously probably going to be much more effective at it than, you know, just us. Than our own preconceived, preconceived notions of how it should be. Let me bring up my chirotis. Likely neighbor of this cat of this of this thing. This guy. Mm. Oh wow. <laughs> so uh, nice little stand for him. Wow. So this was not like, I mean, they look to be kind of an, okay, like this guy kind of already, like this seems like a fair even match to a certain extent. Like right. Mackay Rodas had like the paws and the teeth. Dino Kakuda had the bulk and the bite. But for most of time, like Mackay Rodas was about like a small lion size. And this was not enough to compete with like the garden, mm -hmm. well, uh, with the even bigger Dino Kakuda. And I think later, as Macairotis, Amphi Macairotis developed in size, he was also a factor in creating opportunities for scavenging for Dino Kakuda. They eventually. Certainly he eventually reached the size where he was becoming competitive. But throughout most of time, it was the hyena that was much more dominant as a carnivore, as the dominant carnivore on the land. Until eventually, Machairotis was able to become a more significant player. But either way, he was leaving a lot of material available for the Dino Kukudids to become this size. And the saber tooth factor on land is something that is no longer present. It is no longer a force that is, mm -hmm. you know, that, that creates these opportunities for other carnivores to really partake in osteophagy and then well, other carnivores or other carnivorous activities. But these two were found on the same landscape, you know, China and throughout Eurasia. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would have been interesting to see, you know, just how complex their ecological impacts uh, amongst each other would have been like. Yeah, I mean, they weren't friends. That, that was like that was for sure. They were not. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Not chumming around. I don't know. Did you see that? Um, you you look at uh, what's his name? Uh, Hondari Nundu. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's like, whenever like a new paper drops, he, he has like, his art is always ready. He's there, you know, within he's hours. So quick. He is so quick. And like, I love to I know, it's love crazy. seeing him evolve. His, his art has been evolving. And his art yeah. Really he's gotten so good. He's gotten real good. He's, he's a very dangerous, dangerous artist. <laughs> For sure. It's an interesting way of putting it, but yeah. Have you seen also, um, uh, have you seen Alex J? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. AJ, yeah, yeah. He, he's he's done some. He's his his rate of improvement is crazy too. Oh wow! Have you seen his Dino Krakuda? Yeah, I saw that. I absolutely saw that. Um, his Dino Krakuda is just downright. I mean, it's almost. Nice. It's, it's so natural looking. It's not over exaggerated. It's just there. It's just chilling. It's almost. It's downright almost cuddly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. He has a really good sense of making things look natural. Yeah. Hard to do in sculpture. Oh man, a lot of really good paleo art is coming out now. Like, I mean, it's 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 a movement that has started, and it's only moving in leaps and bounds. Um, and that's definitely, really, and that's really fun to see and fun to participate in. Yeah, we're really like entering like. Uh, just uh, sort of like a new age of mammalian paleo art almost. There's just so much and so like people are really, really putting like time and effort into it. You know, they're like whole you know, paleo artists who are just like basically just focus on mammalian paleo art. Like obviously like Anton, amazing example of that, but like even more and more mammalian paleo artists are entering the scene and it's really, really awesome. Yeah. Who is it? Belzar, Anton, um, mm-hmm. I mean, those two guys have been just like a very potent beacon for my own stuff. I mean, like I've consulted with Belazar a little bit. He's shown me some very cool material, um, criticized some of my work and like, I've, uh, I've, I've actually, I really, I like, and, but Anton has been like so fundamental in my like, in really loving the Sabretooth, for example, which has basically been my obsession. I've sent him a couple of things, like a couple of my videos, and I've I've not yet gotten any replies from him, but like I hope to like <laughs> have attention at some point and collaborate with him or something like that. Yeah, it would be awesome if you got him on here. That would be really cool. I would love that. I would, I mean, I've already talked to um I, I as soon as Alex posted stuff on Instagram, I was like, oh you, <laughs> you know, he really <laughs> caught my eye. Um, and then I mean, your stuff is like obviously after we've talked to. Uh, had that phyla conversation i've been really kind of following your work oh yeah um and oh, thank you yeah man it's 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 just really cool to see that and like that's what i mean that's what i want is i've kind of been lucky enough to have access to the material of these things and that's what i you know it it weird for me to like not say anything about it and that i want to keep talking about these these things and then recently i've also broken into making skeletons and then recently i've also broke like that has transformed into making skeletons out of steel mm-hmm. yeah 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 which is really really potent like i can tell you right now with, utmost, with the utmost confidence that if i had a commission for it i can make you the full skeleton of dino Krakuda, life-size fully standing and that would be amazing oh man it'd be really cool and um you'd really get a sense of just like how large and like tanky the animal is because so much of what you see online is like i don't know really just it's hard to convey just like just the tank that it was you know and i think a sculpture like a life-size skeleton of it would be amazing yeah yeah it's like when you put when you just make it in the flesh it it's a different conversation it's a completely different story um and it's so much more intimate in a much more, I mean, in a mm-hmm. more, more terrifying way. Uh, Drew, is there something that you are particularly mm-hmm. interested in illustrating? Are you like, do you have a piece in mind? Do you have a commission in mind? Do you have a thing that you would love to do and that you see as like something that is like, oh man, if I could just do that thing, draw it, capture it, that would set my heart on fire. Yeah, recently, like as, the trees have turned like yellow and red here. I really want to do like a, a Pleistocene scene in the fall. Hopefully like a Smilodon like stalking through the woodlands as like the, the forest floor is covered in red and yellow leaves and, and like the late afternoon sunset. That would be, that would be amazing. That's really like what I want to do hopefully by the end of this month. Hell yeah, man. Absolutely. We have not- How about you? We have, oh, wow, me. Um, what I would really like to do um, I really want Smilodon to 
kill something. I think we all want that. Yeah. We, we all want that. I recently went through like there's a couple of scenes where Diego from Ice Age, you remember the scene where he like it's just it's in the first one and like everybody's about to go to sleep and Sid is being an annoying person and then all of a sudden everyone falls asleep and then Diego's eyes just go bing. And I like, think so, yeah. There's, there's the thing. <laughs> You know, and then and then there's the in the second one where he does the chase and he doesn't catch the antelope. And I'm like, could yeah. someone and I'm like, could someone feed the saber tooth? And <laughs> that's like that's something that I want to do. Um it's kind of terrifying, but I want to do that. Um you should. So we have not mentioned Julio La Cerda. Oh, I think who wait, what? Julio, Julio. Oh you, yeah, 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 mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge inspiration. I like. Yeah. He is just in the last crazy. few months. He's his like his art has just like gone so good. His small, did you see the Home Ethereum? Yeah, Home Ethereum killed some. That that fallow deer. That was really fallow good. Deer, and he got it right. Um, did you see his like his sloths? His sloths are so mm -hmm. convincing. Super. Yeah, yeah, one of the best paleo artists. Like along with Ville, I think him and uh, Lacerda slots are the most naturalistic looking. Ville, Ville is, I love Ville's sketches. Um, mm -hmm. Sketches are very potent. Um, and like his finished renderings. I love, I love that one where it's like a mammoth skull and then a wolverine on top of it. It's so- And then a what on top of it? Wolverine. Oh. I think that's I think that's Benjamin, not Benjamin. I think that's Tom Bjorklund. That's Tom Bjorklund. Never mind. That's Tom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom. Bjorklund. But he does have a very similar piece. He has a piece of the woolly mammoth skull and then three reindeer in the background. Something. Vil. Vil. Yes. Vil has gotten some um, some three D stuff. He's got a three D sloth. Mm -hmm. He's got a three D kylotherium. I think a female. Yep. Um, I think I think so. It might have been a teleosaurus. I'm not sure. But yeah, he's also a very skilled sculptor as well. Oh, so yeah. skilled, so good. And so then, talented. And Gabriel Utego, who's just like on a roll like nothing else. Who? Sorry. Uh, I... G Gabriel Utego. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you seen his um his uh, South American field chart? Yeah. Or was it just um, North American and South American? That one was so good. That one was cats. So I really like that. He had a few cats. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I appreciated yeah. how he could just get on a roll and just, just, just slice, just go, 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 go. I know. He puts out so much work. It's crazy. I don't know how he does it. Dane, he is so prolific. And I think it's just because I think he's had a background of like drawing a lot of scales on reptiles. And then that just like got his hand honed in. Yeah, yeah, um, that's true. And like him is just like, oh yeah, another dinosaur. Go, go, go. <laughs> really great. Really, really great. Yeah, he, and those ink sketches he does, he's been doing for October are just so quality. I admire that so much when people just commit to like ink October or this and that. I think next year what I'd love to do, I'd like to do Saber yeah. September. I'd like, like, I'm just going to say that right now. I want Sabertooth. That would be cool. Sabertooth September 2021. It's going to be a thing. Um, for anybody. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to be a thing. And it's, oh my God, it's going to be, oh my God, it's going to be. I think it's, I mean, I think already it's going to attract, <laughs> like this next year is going to attract this realm that we're participating in. is going to attract a lot more traction, commissions, works, interests. But then, like, if Sabretooth 2020 happens, Hopefully. it's gonna be, it's gonna be a mess, man. It's gonna be a night. It's gonna be nuts. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> oh man, I look forward to that. I look forward to that too. It's gonna be quite terrifying. Oh man, Drew, let's wrap it up. Let's let's be thankful for the for the connection that we've had. Um, I am really thankful that you participated in this it's something that i've been looking forward to for a while wow oh. drew thank you so much for okay cool this has been oh. really great i am very glad no, thank you <laughs> i'm glad to have shared with you the hyenas and i think i've shared them with the right person i'm glad to hear that
Thank you for sharing them with me. Absolutely. They are meant to be shared and they're meant to be celebrated as amazing creatures of our planet. For sure. And I hope that, and I believe in that, the, our planet is going to be and will stay a diverse and predator rich place that can strengthen landscapes and strengthen people as well together. And that Let's we, hope so. And that, yes, and that we could all learn from this giant, amazing, rich, and new body of knowledge, which is 100, 150 years old, this evolution of species and paleontology. I think it is yet to really permeate the wider culture out there. And we are at the forefront of doing that because we literally have them at the tip of our pencil. It's a good way of putting it. David Attenborough is like a huge inspiration for you, I think for, for all of us, as I think to a certain degree. And his message is amazing. It's true, it's earth affirmative. And that is exactly what I want this whole movement to be. Yes, I agree, I agree. <laughs> all right. Check out that new documentary in that case on Netflix. Go check that out, Absolutely. anyone listening. Drew, any final last words from you? I look forward to uh, seeing, uh, I look forward to uh, Sabretooth, well, Sabretooth September 2021. Yes. That's going to be on my calendar. Awesome. And I look forward to seeing more posts from you on your Instagram and on your Twitter. Um, your work, your work is very potent and I look forward to seeing it more. Drew. Yes. Let's call it, let's call it there. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for mm -hmm. tuning in, and I suppose until next time. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Have an awesome day. <laughs> See ya. You too. Bye-bye. So thank you for making it all the way to the end of this video. I hope that this talk was revealing to you, uh, just as it was for me. And uh, if this was interesting to you, please be sure to uh, write a comment, uh, like, share, subscribe, whatever. And uh, I hope to do a whole bunch more of these. You know, there's a lot of animals to talk about and um, a lot of interesting things that could be covered in terms of animals' ecology, in terms of their function, in terms of our relationship with them and uh, our shared future with wildlife and wild spaces. So I hope you enjoyed this video and until next time.